Hiya besties, what's good? So as you all know, I am a very big fan of the celebrity book club kind of videos. I'm a Jack Edwards fan, in case you couldn't tell. I like it when people read other people's favorite books, share their opinions on them, psychoanalyze them. I love getting recommendations from random places, basically. But this time, I wanted to take them from somebody that I actually know and love and who lives in my mind rent-free. I mean, she's there anyway, so she might as well be there some more. I want her to also be there while I'm reading other things that have absolutely nothing to do with her, except for the fact that she's recommended them. I'm talking about the one, the only. Jodie Comer. For my future wife. No, that's up to her. I'll Never mind. Of course, the book that she has recommended most highly in the past couple of months is Big Swiss. I've only seen the synopsis. It looks extremely gay. It looks extremely entertaining. And I cannot fucking wait to read it. But it only comes out in fucking February. I do not have the patience for this. If you didn't know, uh, Big Swiss is the new TV show that Jodie is pre producing i don't know she's gonna be in it it's gonna be very gay it's gonna be fantastic i'm gonna let you in on a little secret the whole reason that i made this channel was so that hopefully one day i might get relevant enough to get an arc for big swiss i don't even know who's publishing it but like if you're watching this please i am begging on my knees i will sell a fucking lung in order to get a big swiss arc i can't wait i just want to read the book Please! But yeah, that's not gonna happen for a bit. So anyway, nobody has made one of these videos for Jodi yet. And to be fair, that is because she doesn't read much. Because I really struggle when I'm reading scripts to delve into anything else. Which is fair. I get that. However, I have done some digging and I have found a few. Now, I have no idea if these are her actual favorite books. She didn't say so. She just said that she liked them, some of them not even that. But you know what? She's free to correct me if I'm wrong. I would love to hear her tell me which books actually are her favorite. I'm listening. I'll go anywhere you want to go. Take me to places that I don't know. Introduce me to books that I didn't know were your favorites. The first book I found was in her video for Vogue and they asked her what she was reading and she said East of Eden by, no, not by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She was recommended it by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I've just started East of Eden because, again, Phoebe Waller-Bridge told me to read it and anything that Phoebe Waller-Bridge tells me to do, I do it. Honestly, same, except this time because I am not going to read East of Eden. Not this week, at least. Mostly because she didn't give any indication of whether or not she liked it. She just said she was reading it. So decided to leave that one to the side because I found some more. Firstly, I found a Vanity Fair article where she was asked for her favorites. They were like rapid fire questions. She was asked what her essentials were. And for books, she said this one, The Course of Love by someone with a French name. I'm scared to say it, but I'm sure you've heard of this because a lot of people are talking about it. And a lot of people are not saying good things about it, but I had already gotten it, so now I have to commit. And also, there's a lot of things that I would do for Jodie Comer. This is gonna have to be one of them. Another book that she mentions in that article, she was reading it at the time she was being interviewed. That's why she mentioned it. And it was Three Women by Lisa Tadeo, but I haven't been able to find it yet. We will see if that one comes up in this video or not, because there's also another one. I found a book that she recommended in an Instagram story, and that happened to be a book that I bought recently, and it's In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. And I love that because I was going to read it anyway. Actually, I am making this video before I have all the books because I cannot wait to start reading this. I read one page and I know I'm going to love this. This is going to be a favorite. Well, I might disappoint myself saying that, but I do trust Jodie Como with my heart and my soul, and my hand in marriage. Okay, so that's two. I mentioned that I was maybe also going to get Three Women by Lisa Tadeo, even though she didn't say whether or not she liked it, but I read the synopsis and I liked it. The synopsis, at least. The other one I'm thinking about getting for this video is The End We Start From by Megan Hunter, because she will be playing the lead character in the adaptation. I think it's gonna be a film pretty sure she doesn't have time for tv shows at this point she only chooses things that she really wants to do i think that this book is something that she would recommend if she was asked 
directly. So yeah, it's gonna be either one of those two. We'll figure out as the video goes, because I'm definitely starting with Inner Dream House and then probably the other one because I already have it. And um, then we'll see. I will get back to you. Hi, so I just got done with uh, In the Dream House. I bought some excellent books in London, really, they were all four star reads. Anyway, um, now this um, was by no means a fun book. I knew that going into it, luckily, but this is a memoir of a woman who has come out of an abusive relationship with another woman. It mostly just talks about how lesbian abuse and queer abuse in general is not really talked about yet and how that is a very toxic thing for queer people in the words of carmen maria machado herself what she says is that our culture doesn't have an investment in helping queer folks understand what their experiences mean and that's very true and it talks a bit about representation one part of which really spoke to me because of jody which i dog is hold on there's a chapter about queer villains i i just thought it was very um not funny but like to imagine jody reading that part Anyway, so it's about queer coding villains and how that's problematic because, uh, you know, that's all the representation that queer people used to get. She says that she recognizes the problem that we have with queer villains, but then she writes, I cannot help but love these fictional queer villains. I love them for all of their aesthetic lushness and theatrical glee, their fabulousness, their ruthlessness, their power. They're always by far the most interesting characters on screen. After all, they live in a world that hates them. They've adapted, they've learned to conceal themselves, and they've survived. Take notes, Laura Neal. But like, that's literally what Villanelle is, and that is also the reason that Jodie likes Villanelle so much, and that Jodie loved playing her so much, because she had a lot of aesthetic lushness and theatrical glee, she was fabulous. I really liked that in relation to Jodie, because it then goes on to say that queer villains are nowadays not necessarily a problem anymore, because as long as you have other queer characters to surround the problematic one, it takes away their villainous in relation to their queerness, and it turns them human, which is the representation that we actually need so that we can recognise not necessarily villainousness, but we should be able to recognise badness in queer people because it exists and we should be talking about that rather than presenting queer people to be these like flawless beings who are just perfect all the time which is something that we do as a response to wanting to have rights we want to show that we are deserving of rights but when we present ourselves to be these perfect human beings who can do absolutely no wrong then that is possibly more harmful than good. And that's also something that this book talks about a lot. I thought that was a very interesting way of um, looking at it and um, very important to discuss. There is also a part in here that talks about the way that domestic abuse, but especially domestic abuse in queer relationships is handled in court. There was a part of it that really reminded me of Prima Facie. Okay, so this is about abuse that is not necessarily physical or there was no physical response to it so there's no proof she writes the legal system sets a standard by which stories of battered women are judged if there is no legally designated assault she is not a victim regardless of how debilitating her experience has been how complete her isolation or how horrifically emotional abuse she has suffered and by creating this kind of myopia about the nature of domestic violence the legal system does battered woman a grave injustice that reminded me of the ending of prima facie without spoilers but like that's uh, what the play is about the legal system not showing up for women in general but in this case it also becomes very clear that queer women not so queer women of color especially are just left behind by a system that doesn't recognize their situation because we don't talk about it nobody talks about it and so i find this a very important book jody didn't really say anything about this aside from 10 out of 10 i assume which means that she probably likes it um i don't see why not the the it's not really prose because it's it's mostly facets of like memories and things that happened but the writer uses the dream house as like the setting for all of this happening because there's a lot of metaphors around houses it's like what is going on behind closed doors that you can't see that's sort of what 
it keeps playing with. I thought the word choice was very beautiful. I thought the metaphors were very beautiful. They weren't like overdone as memoirs can sometimes get in my experience. Uh, this one wasn't like that. I thought it was really beautifully written. Let's see if I can find like a beautiful quote for you. Our bodies are ecosystems and they shed and replace and repair until we die. And when we die, our bodies feed the hungry earth. Our cells becoming part of other selves, and in the world of the living where we used to be, people kiss and hold hands and fall in love and fuck and laugh and cry and hurt others and nurse broken hearts and start wars and pull sleeping children out of car seats and shout at each other. If you could harness that energy, that constant roving hunger, you could do wonders with it. You could push the earth inch by inch through the cosmos until it collided head first with the sun. It also has some great parts about what it's like to have anxiety <laughs> and to have that anxiety kind of used against you but she also talks of how she has always had anxiety and I found that very um, eye-opening for myself so yeah I gave this eight and a half out of ten uh, it's not a ten shit I'm not doing exactly what Jodie's doing why not a ten no you know what I should stand by that it was an eight and a half for me and that's very good okay no take backs one down two to go I'm curious if we're gonna keep up this good streak. I don't think so, but we will see. Hi, I am currently on page 77 of this book and I am struggling. <laughs> First of all, who is this man? Can anyone tell me who this man is? And who the fuck gave him the authority to pull all of this, these boring ass theories about love out of his ass and present them to us as fact who is he oh excuse me i'm sorry the man is a philosopher and an author of course we cannot forget who else is he oh yeah right he has a fucking church or something a school of life okay l ron hubbard this is raw fucking nightmare material my camera just chooses to focus on Hugo instead. So true. I decided to keep notes. This is all hate. <laughs> Why do men have no problem at all having thoughts and just pretending that that's the stone cold truth? There's no other thing that is more fact than their thoughts. And we all have to know this. We all have to believe. And I just don't. It's like, it's a book about how a marriage should be. But it's like, it's written super stoically. And that, like, this man has written like 15 non-fiction books. And he should have kept doing that. I would absolutely not touch those with a 10-foot pole. But fiction is definitely not his forte. I don't think this man has ever heard of the concept show don't tell. In fact, he is making a point of doing the exact opposite. He is just telling, not showing anything. It is just so not for me. I have my own thoughts about love and how it should be, and it is not this. I disagree with so many of his silly little takes that I sometimes genuinely wonder if he is being serious. And where does he pull all of this information from? Like, what are your sources? Maybe men don't need sources. I guess they don't. But like, it sounds so Freudian. Like, he keeps talking about parents and like how you were raised plays into how you are in relationships. And sure, I believe all of that. But the way that he says it without pulling up any evidence or I don't know, it, it just... No, I don't agree with you and I don't have to because you're not giving me sources so these are just your opinions as far as I'm concerned and I do not care for the opinions of a man. I just, I, I don't, I, I need men to stop. I need men to stop. This is a tough one to get through. It's just, it's rough. And it's also, like, it's very hard to read for some reason. I don't know, the sentences, they run on and on and on, and it's like... <sighs> this is so boring! I just do not have the patience for it. I can't, I cannot be bothered with this, but I feel like I have to finish it, because 
I would do anything for Jody. I have to prove that point, sadly. Anything for Jody, anything for Jody, anything for Jody, anything for Jody, anything for Jody. Okay, let's continue. Okay, I just had a shower, so like, don't perceive me, but I finished it this morning, but at what cost? I have never so violently disagreed with an author. I was reading this at the laundromat and I have never been so curious about what would happen if you tried to wash a book. I was fantasizing about watching it in there, being violently spun around and washed with water until there was nothing left of it. I have a lot to say. It wasn't just the notes, this is another page of them. Uh, I also started taking notes in the book you know, sometimes a page just can't get away with having printed on it what's printed on it. I had to compensate. It just got worse and worse and worse and worse. You know, it's only 220 pages, so like, that's a good length, but it's about 200 pages too long to contain the simple yet completely pointless message that all marriage eventually ends in boredom and despair and that instead of working on that you should just accept that because disappointment is a part of life that's it that's the message of this book the message is also you don't have to be nice to your spouse if you have an excuse not to be i thought this book was going to be like a book about how to have a good marriage and i think it's genuinely intended that way but instead of coming with solutions to problems that people in relationships face, like having frustrations with one another and having urges to have sex with other people, which is like, I understand that that happens, but instead of offering solutions or like advice, it just comes with excuses to why people do that and why that is okay. If you are going to consider writing a book about a couple and how you think a marriage should work, you would think that you would choose to write a couple who does this perfectly the way you think it should be. But he doesn't do that. He is writing about a couple who does it wrong and then every couple of paragraphs he keeps giving his two cents on how he thinks they should have handled the situation instead of how they actually did it. And it's like, that's not how fiction works, is it? There's this whole part in there about cheating and it's basically like, monogamy is impossible. That's his stance on that. And you know what? I think that's right. I think that monogamy isn't for some people, right? To say all people, kind of a bold step. But okay, even if you want to go there, like, you could make a point for that, right? But instead, what he does is not... Like, he doesn't criticize the grounds of marriage in itself. He basically acts like married people are a victim of all these expectations that people put on them when nobody forced you to get married. Like, who was holding you at gunpoint? He felt so fucking sorry for himself. Oh, there was some gaslighting in there as well that was just completely okay because I don't fucking know. <laughs> Someone's named Bestie. That is funny though. That is funny. I'll give him that. Okay, I forgot what I was saying, so I'm just going to continue with, like, my biggest note. The part that made me question, is this a real book? Am I reading a parody? This is a huge red flag. I said that specifically about the line, We are so impressed by honesty that we forget the virtues of politeness. A desire not always to confront people we care about with the full hurtful aspects of our nature. After which I wrote, are you fucking kidding me? First of all, you can have conversations about this before you get married. You know words, they're in your brain. You can use them. You can communicate these things with your partner. You could, instead of doing the wrong thing and then blaming it on unrealistic expectations when you didn't have to follow those expectations. What bothered me even more is that this fictionalized man, let's be honest, probably just to self-insert, he talks about his daughter like this is inevitably also going to happen to her. And I'm like, why? 
maybe your daughter doesn't want to get married. Like, it's not like marriage is the end all be all for literally every person. It's not, it's really not. In fact, at the end of it, I wrote, thank you, Mr. de Bouton, for reminding me why I am single. Happily so. Because this sounds like hell. This is a hellscape that y'all created by yourselves. Oh, and also, every time lesbians are mentioned twice, he gets so weird about it. And it's just, it made me so uncomfortable. Oh my God. I hate men. I don't ever want to read a book written by a white cis man ever again. Ugh! Yeah, so I have never been so annoyed with a book in my entire life. I write this in the name of love and um, I know that I said she was my future wife. Jodi, if we ever do get to that point, we need to have a stone talk about your expectations of marriage because that's not what I want. And I don't think it's what you want either. I don't think anyone wants that. Okay, anyway, moving on because I'm just viscerally angry at this point. Anyway, the very sad news is that I did order the last book I want to read for this video, but the book has been delayed. So now I have to wait for two more weeks. I will definitely like it better than this one. It can only go up from here. We're going back to women writing. That's better. So I will see you when I... Jesus. All right. I will see you when the last book comes in. Hi. As you can see, ages have passed since that last fiasco that uh, we will never talk about again. I've recovered. I've gotten over it. I feel better now. I can move on with my life. As I predicted, things went up from there. I finished Three Women by Lisa Tadeo yesterday. I didn't realize when I was researching this book, obviously I wasn't, uh, that this is non-fiction, but it doesn't read that way. Basically the premise of this book is that the author was researching the way that people experience desire. And in the beginning of her research, she was interviewing everybody. She was interviewing men too, but she quickly realized that men experienced desire the same boring way <laughs> and so she decided to focus on women instead because women had all these way more interesting stories and way more like visceral experiences and deep feelings that she was a lot more interested in so she settled on these three women who were willing to share the entire story of desire in their lives that has somehow either ruined it or like been of importance in their life uh, one of them follows a girl who was groomed by a high school teacher, which I found interesting because when I was reading that, I realized that that's what happened to Villanelle. We don't talk about that. I feel like Jody was the only one who really did something with that. Because I rewatched the scenes yesterday where she sees Anna again for the first time and she is she is so unsettled by that. It's so sad to think about, but yeah, that's what that reminded me of. Obviously, this is a real person, so it's uh, it was very upsetting to read about that and hear. The second woman is having an affair on her negligent husband, uh, to say the least. And the third woman is in a polyamorous relationship, open relationship. It's not really open because her husband is always with her. Actually, their marriage was the marriage that should have been at the forefront of that other book because this was a good marriage. I like this marriage. That woman, she was my favorite. I feel like she got the least attention out of the three of them. Uh, I feel like she was a bit left behind in the way that these stories kind of worked around each other. They didn't really intertwine. They had absolutely nothing to do with each other. And at some points I felt like it was just a bit confusing to read about them all jumbled up. I feel like that somehow could have been better, but overall it was, it, it was good. It was very interesting to read about this. You could feel the honesty on the pages. Fair warning though, this does discuss a lot of sexual assault and just unpleasant things in general that happen to women because that's kind of the point. I think the most important thing that reminded me why I read this because of Jodi, the girl who was groomed by her teacher, she decides to take it to court a couple of years later when she's older. And um, the trial is the thing that's like at the forefront of her narrative. It resonated so much <laughs> with Prima Facie that it was actually just 
it was upsetting but it was so frustrating to read because in the beginning what the author says about her specifically is i will be telling the narrative as seen through her eyes meanwhile a version of this story was put before a jury who saw it very differently part of her narrative poses for the reader the all too familiar question of when and why and by whom women's stories are believed and when and why and by whom they are not and it also really at the end kind of more goes into like the justice system and how it doesn't work for victims of these things because of how society treats women in general and how it's so hard to get justice for things like this because people just don't like when women speak up <laughs> And that's something that we see in The Last Jewel, that's something that we see in Prima Facie, that's something that sometimes we even see in Killing Eve. I feel like that's something that's close to Jodie's heart. That showed <laughs> with this book, which is funny because she didn't even recommend this one, she just said that she was reading it. It felt like she should have recommended this one instead of The Course of Love. What I did notice in this book is that it's very much like, you can't trust other women. Uh, other women are the worst, <laughs> is basically what this book is saying, and I guess like in these women's experiences that is true uh we do get to see that but i feel like overall that shouldn't have been the message of the book i felt kind of weird about that because that is not my experience at all but maybe that's a queer thing maybe that's just the women i hang out with i don't know but yeah i, f I felt a bit weird about that and that's why i could never give it the five stars. i wasn't going to give it five stars anyway i gave it uh four stars but i think i would have it was a seven and a half so like it was a bit less than four stars but yeah overall it was a it was a good book it was interesting i just wish there had been more about sloan because we love a healthy polyamorous relationship so yeah say what you will but these three look amazing together we have to give her that if i had to pick a favorite well i've already picked a favorite we all know it was this one this one was the best one uh, by far. What do I think this tells me about Jodi? Um, taking this one out of the equation, I've done that to that book so many times at this point. These two very clearly tell a message that Jodi likes to bring across as well. Like I said in The Last Jewel, in um, Prima Facie, sometimes in Killing Eve though not as um, clearly maybe. <laughs> I don't really have much to psychoanalyze her by but I do think that she has a very clear preference for a certain type of issue that she wants to bring to light and she is so right for that. It's a very wonderful thing to have such a clear direction as an actor. I feel like she really views her work as art with a purpose and it feels to me that that truly is the case. I really admire her for that. So we had one blip in this video but we will ignore that even though I ranted about it for like 20 minutes but like let's just focus on these two, right? These were very good. So Jodi, if you still want to talk after I absolutely obliterated one of your favorite books, we can talk about these or we can have a healthy discussion on how marriage should not be. I am very happy that Jodi was my first celebrity book club person. Uh, I think I already know who my second one is going to be. If you have any guesses as to who that is, leave them in the comments. But yeah, this was actually fun because, you know, getting recommendations from a place where you don't normally get it, you don't really know what you're going to get. It, sometimes it's going to be a hit and other times it's going to be a massive, massive miss. But yeah, you know, sometimes you do find a gem. Thank you so much for watching this. If you watched it all the way through my massive, massive rant on a book that everybody already hated anyway. I appreciate that. I hope you'll come hang out again next time. Like, comment, subscribe, uh, do those things and don't forget to read So Much Blues. That is my first and foremost recommendation. I also, I feel like Jodie would like that one too. Ooh. This is me recommending Jody a book, and it's so much blues. I'll see you next time. Why well, can't I can't read out loud? I just can't do this. I need to get one of those Google voices to read things for me because I cannot read. Fuck, I seriously cannot read. Again, I cannot read, but I'm gonna do it anyway. By elevating, by elevating, Jesus Christ. This is my one hobby in life. Ugh.